If you've been playing games for any amount of time, then you most certainly have memories of playing games on your childhood CRT. Yet for all their history, in so short of time, CRTs have fallen into disuse. Large and bulky in comparison to the sleek and thin screens of today, most people think of CRTs as useless, unwanted space wasters that you couldn't pay someone to take away. Throughout the RGB Masterclass series, we've talked a lot about how our RGB journey began with researching video scalers for playing retro consoles in high quality on modern HDTVs. But that's not the solution that everyone is looking for. To get the best picture, sometimes you've got to go backwards. Wait a second, so why would I want to deal with one of those big old TVs? Welcome to RGB 104. Let's take a look at gaming the old-fashioned way. Cathode ray tubes drove television technology for over half a century. Giant glass bulbs in big bulky boxes. While nearly everyone has moved on to flat panel HDTVs at this point, CRTs are still coveted by retro gamers. In fact, many would argue that CRTs are the absolute best way. Some would go so far as to say, the only way to play retro video games the way the developers intended. Whether you agree or disagree is up to you. Home console games designed for standard definition CRTs in North America primarily use resolutions of 240p or 480i. That's progressive and interlaced respectively. Just in case you don't know, the short explanation is that progressive resolutions display a full frame at once, while interlaced resolutions rapidly alternate lines of horizontal resolution as a way of showing more detail. But this also results in a flicker or shimmering effect in areas of high contrast and fine detail. 240p was the most common resolution for games up through the late 90s, with 480i not becoming standard for gameplay until the release of the Dreamcast. Nowadays, modern HDTVs struggle with 240p, generally mistaking the image as interlaced, one culprit in why they often display old games as worse than you remember. In truth, 240p is actually more like a cool trick than a proper standard, a method of getting a rock-solid progressive image out of video games that just so happened to work with the established 480i video standard of the day. It's also the reason for the visible scanline effect. More on that a bit later. You probably know that regions like Europe, Australia, and many others historically used the PAL video standard, which is different from the NTSC standard used in North America, Japan, and parts of South America. PAL actually has more resolution than NTSC, 576 horizontal lines as opposed to 480 lines. Due to the electricity standards of each country, most PAL systems run at a refresh of approximately 50 Hz versus NTSC's 60 Hz. You can easily translate these into potential frame rates, 60 frames per second being possible with NTSC. Theoretically, PAL does have some advantages over NTSC, like much less sensitivity to color errors. But it has a poor reputation with gamers due to the way that many games were converted to PAL. To avoid extensive recoding of a game's operations, they were simply slowed down by about 17% to match 50 hertz. PAL region games also tended to look a bit squashed due to the unused extra lines of resolution fit into the same physical screen space. 
Thankfully, modern games and displays have negated these issues for all regions. Here in North America, consumer-grade CRT televisions offered a variety of inputs throughout their history. Growing up, it was a long time before my family ever had a TV with anything other than a single coaxial input for RF video. As time went on, composite, S-video, and even component inputs began to appear on affordable consumer televisions. Of course, we're pretty jealous of the RGB-capable SCART connectors that were prominent in Europe and the JP21 connections in Japan. However, we can use a SCART to component transcoder to convert the signal to something we can use. Here's what all of these signals look like on a typical North American consumer television. So, the big question. Why play on a bulky CRT instead of a sleek HDTV, or with an upscaler? First and foremost, lag. HDTVs suffer from varying degrees of input lag due to the processing required to scale a low-resolution image across a larger expanse of pixels, causing a small delay between the press of a button and visual feedback on the screen. As we covered in RGB301, much of the unwanted image processing can usually be turned off with your TV's game mode reducing the delay, but it cannot be eliminated completely. Even external scalers, like the Framemeister, while much better optimized for retro gaming than any modern HDTV's built-in scaler, still introduces a small amount of lag. Most CRTs, on the other hand, have no inherent input lag. This can be critical for many people's enjoyment, especially when it comes to action games, fighting games, and rhythm games. In the world of speedrunning, where success often depends on perfecting execution down to the frame, CRTs are standard equipment. This is also important when it comes to using light guns, which rely on both the brightness of the electron beam, as well as the exact timing standards of CRT televisions to detect successful hits. They simply won't work on any HDTV, not even HD CRTs. For similar reasons, all you people out there using active shutter 3D glasses like those for the Sega Master System or Famicom are just out of luck when using an HDTV. Oh well. Black levels are often touted as another major advantage of CRTs. This describes how close the true black of the darkest part of the image can be. In the early days of LCD and plasma TVs, they could appear very washed out compared to CRTs. But as these technologies have improved, and new types of screens like OLED have come about, the perceptible gap has closed significantly. Then there's the matter of scan lines. CRT fans tend to be very fond of scan lines, and many consider them to be an integral part of the retro gaming experience. So what are scan lines, and why are they there? Well, here's a quick rundown. When a 240p image is sent to the TV, half of the screen at real estate is unused. Instead of doubling the lines or squishing the image, it spaces out each line instead, filling in the gaps with a blank line. So are the blank lines the scan lines? Well, technically, no. Any line used by the display is a scan line. The electron gun scans the image across the surface of the glass screen. The blank lines are simply nothing, but they are perceived as key to the look. So why is this effect more pronounced on some TVs than on others? A lot of it has to do with the TV's size. Check out the difference between this tiny 14-inch Toshiba compared to this 27-inch Toshiba, both similar models. Combined with the tube's inherent Gaussian blur, Scan lines help give sprites and other graphics a more rounded, organic feel, instead of the more blocky appearance we've gotten used to because of HDTVs, emulators, or even the influence of modern retro-styled indie games. Many believe that artists would take advantage of the scan lines and poorer quality video signals present on a CRT display to hide the quirks in the graphics, such as the famous dithered transparencies on Genesis games. This is a major crux in the argument for CRTs being the only way to preserve the original vision of the artists. And while it's an interesting point, we can't say for sure if every artist felt there was only one best way to display their work. It's also likely that game artists viewed their work on professional video monitors. Wait, professional video monitors? What are those?
the reason we always have to be so specific when we say consumer televisions is because even from way back, RGB was alive and well in professional video monitors, devices commonly used in television production, medical monitoring, or even security. Built to last and be kept turned on for 24 hours a day, many professional CRT monitors have RGB inputs, typically in the form of BNC connectors, which are functionally similar to RCA connectors, but with a locking mechanism. Many retro consoles natively support RGB video despite RGB's absence from the North American consumer market. And most other consoles can be modified for RGB output. Needless to say, this makes professional video monitors extremely sought after by the retro gaming community, even though they were never marketed to us while they were in production. We collaborated with Phone Dork to get a lot of our video material on professional monitors. He's got this unbelievable setup and has access to some really cool gear. If you're into gaming on CRTs, do yourself a favor and check out his channel. Professional video monitors are often generically referred to as PVMs, but technically this is the official name of Sony's popular line of professional monitors. You might also run into the abbreviation BVM, or Broadcast Video Monitor, which is a premium variation of Sony's PVM line, said by many to be the best CRTs in existence. Because of the higher quality phosphors and the ability to display a larger number of lines, RGB on a PVM can look absolutely stunning. It feels like another type of technology altogether, giving it an almost otherworldly look compared to a regular old CRT. So how do you get the RGB signal from your console to a PVM? The breakout cables we use have a standard European SCART connector on one end, which receives a SCART cable either directly from a console or from a SCART switcher. Be aware of the cables you have because you don't want to mix up SCART with the identical looking JP21. On the other end, it breaks out into four BNC cables and two RCA audio connectors, with the BNC connectors carrying separate red, green, blue, and sync signals. Depending on your PVM, you may need a different type of connector to get pure RGB, like this 25 pin D sub. Be sure you know what kind of connector your setup needs. Now, back up a second. What was that about sync? <laughs> Not that again. Well, thankfully, it's a bit more straightforward when it comes to PVMs. PVMs handle sync in two different ways, RGBS and RGBHV. It's easy to tell which one you need. If your PVM has a separate BNC input for sync, it uses RGBS. Just plug in the fourth BNC and hit the external sync button on your monitor. If there's instead a knob labeled H and V, then you'll adjust the monitor's horizontal and vertical hold manually. We bought our PVM cables from WookieWin on eBay, who helped us understand what we needed. If your PVM requires a different connector, check out what's available at the UK site, Retro Gaming Cables. If your PVM does have RGB outputs, but you aren't planning to use them, check if your picture seems too bright. If so, you may need to cap them with these little things. 75 ohm terminators. That's pretty easy. Some PVMs have this functionality built in, so if it looks normal, just don't worry about it. An alternative to RGB cables for PVMs are component cables fitted with BNC adapters. While RGB is technically a type of component video itself, the generic term component video typically refers to the YPBPR color space. Different from RGB, but with essentially the same results. Switching your PVM's color space to YPBPR would allow you to hook up, say, a PS2, GameCube, or Xbox with component cables 
or even older consoles with RGB to component conversion solutions like the previously mentioned SCART to component boxes or HD Retrovision's SNES and Sega Genesis cables. Image settings may have to be tinkered with since improperly processed YPBPR can lack the fixed white balance of true RGB. It's also possible that your PVM could adhere to an older professional standard and not the consumer standard used in game consoles, requiring a mode switch or further adjustments. Some PVMs and BVMs also have slots that allow for additional connections. These are handy if you want to run both RGB and component sources to one monitor. In PVM and general CRT discussion, you might be confused when you see numbers like 15 kHz, 24 kHz, and 31 kHz with no hints as to what that means or if it's even important. This has to do with the horizontal refresh, how many horizontal lines are drawn in one second, a process so fast we can't see it. The vertical refresh is something you already know. 60 Hz for NTSC and 50 Hz for PAL. How long it takes to draw the entire screen. So why do we care how long it takes one line to be drawn? Because it defines how many lines of resolution the screen can have. That TV you bought from Goodwill for 10 bucks? 15 kilohertz. That's for all standard definition CRTs that accept 240p and 480i and the equivalent PAL resolutions. 31 kilohertz is the domain of 480p and VGA monitors. For example, the Dreamcast will display at 31 kilohertz when connected to a classic style PC monitor with a VGA box. If you're looking for a 480p CRT, unfortunately, any sets that you see called EDTV or Enhanced Definition TV are probably actually digital. So what about 24 kilohertz? Well, I wouldn't worry too much about that one because it mainly has to do with arcade games from the 90s and Japanese computers like the PC-88. Most PVMs are only 15 kilohertz, but many later PVMs can also handle resolutions beyond 480i. 480p on a professional monitor is absolutely stunning. It has to be seen to be believed. Some professional monitors even support 720p and 1080i. As well as both NTSC and PAL. But what about those high definition consumer CRTs? Well, this 36 inch Sony Trinitron was my holy grail for years until I finally bought it in 2004. In retrospect, I'm not sure I knew what I was buying into. Since I had had pretty crappy TVs up until that point in my life, I didn't have an appreciation for how standard definition CRTs drew retro game images. I did enjoy this TV for quite a number of years, but in truth, HD CRTs and many other CRTs from the early 2000s treat retro games much more like a modern HD TV. In other words, digital processing that interprets 240p as 480i, resulting in no distinguishable scan lines and subpar scaling. It's unfortunately not at all like the results that you can get from a PVM. Even a good standard definition CRT is better suited for retro gaming and much less trouble. I will say that mine handles 480p quite nicely, but for 720p and up, it fails to deliver the clarity of fixed pixel HD TVs like LCDs. We could fill hours on the subject of CRTs, but let's close with just a few more thoughts. You know how most CRTs have what you would call a bubble screen, where it curves outwards? Well, the whole thing is built like a bulb which helps it focus light from the electron gun. Many later CRTs have a flat surface, which seems nice in theory, but this can emphasize flaws with the technology. CRTs typically don't have perfect screen geometry. 
Screen geometry basically means how consistent shapes are across the entire screen. Squares won't necessarily be true squares, and lines won't necessarily be straight. It's not all that noticeable with film images or 3D games, but in side-scrolling games, inconsistencies in shape across the screen can be really distracting, with the image noticeably stretching and contracting as the scene scrolls. We've already done an episode on the 240p test suite, which can help you identify flaws in your CRT's geometry. It's possible to calibrate this with your TV's hidden service menu, but you can potentially damage your set if you force it too far out of spec. This is a pretty involved topic all on its own, so look for more information on resolving your CRT's geometry in a future video in the RGB 300 series. So, how do you find a good CRT these days? While great consumer models are still readily available for dirt cheap in many thrift stores, tracking down a PVM, BVM, or any other professional RGB monitor is going to take a lot of sleuthing. By now, many TV studios have probably given away or trashed most of their old monitors. You might find some at electronics recycling facilities, medical equipment resellers, or sometimes even conventions or local game stores. You'll be lucky to find a PVM or BVM on Craigslist that isn't hundreds of miles away so paying expensive shipping on eBay might be your only option. It's hard to say what kind of future there is for our old CRTs. Unless someone starts making new sets specifically for retro gamers, we're dealing with a limited resource that will naturally die off as they're used. How feasible is repair for the long term? Could new technology come along that treats retro games in the same way a CRT would? Should we just get used to how modern TVs and upscalers display retro games? That's up to you, but for now, let's enjoy retro gaming on CRTs and preserve them for as long as we can.